So good afternoon. Um, so la last lecture before, before reading week. Um, and uh, yes. Woo. Uh, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna celebrate by talking about the last topic of the, of the chapter. So, so this, this is the last topic. This is kind of a wrap-up topic. We've dealt with lots of different methods. Um, from F is equal to MA to work energy, new concepts, momentum, and impulse. I'm going to throw one more thing at you. Okay? And so everything that we've been talking about so far with momentum and impulse applies to objects that are moving in straight lines, uh, which therefore carry linear momentum. As soon as things start to spin or rotate around objects, there actually is another type of momentum that has to be discussed, and that is angular momentum and impulse. So everything that revolves around an axis of rotation also has an angular momentum associated with that particular particle. Okay? So I wanna, I wanna, this is the, 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 the last topic and the only topic I'll be talking about today, but it's, it's a very colorful topic, lots of different things to talk about, and I'll try to get to one final example. Here's where I'm going to start. Okay? I'm going to remind you guys of high school, where you, were, where, where you should have been introduced to moments and torques. And in moments, you know that there is a force applied over a moment arm. Right? So you should be very familiar with the idea of, here's the particle. I have the particle sitting a distance r away from this axis of rotation 0, or O. And if I apply a force in that particular direction, the moment or torque on that particular object is basically given by that equation, MO is equal to RO cross F. Okay? And for the first time in this course, I'm introducing the idea of cross product. And so if you, if you recall back in your, I guess in your linear algebra course, um, and, and even hopefully you've seen this uh, in, in, in other places as well, but we, you've dealt with dot product and you should be familiar with cross product. How do you deal with cross product? Cross product is vector pointing with your right hand. What I do is I point with my fingers, then I curl them in the direction of the second vector. So R goes this way, curl in the direction of F, and your thumb points in the direction of the moment. OK? Is that good? OK. So the difference being that for dot product, the order of the two don't matter. You can switch it as either A dot B or B dot A. In the case of a cross product, it absolutely matters, because depending on your right-hand rule, if you go R cross F, your thumb points out of the board. But if you go F cross R, your thumb points into the board. And so the vectors are opposite each other which means that this order is absolutely critical. OK? So that's, that's, that's the, 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 the spiel on, on R cross F and the, and the cross product. And you'll also remember that mathematically, you should, you should be able to do these as, what is that? You know, you do this determinant. So you have your i, j, k vectors, right? And then you put your r, x, r, y, r, z. Right, your f x f y f z, right? So does it, does does this ring a bell? Hopefully it does, right? And then so you go m o is equal to, and then for the i vector, the i unit vector, it's you get rid of these and you go r y f z minus r z f y, etc. Right? Plus j. And j is then rzfx minus rxfz plus k rxfy minus ryfx. Okay, that's how you do the math. Okay, so how does this apply to angular momentum? Here's the here's the um, Here's the link between the two. If linear momentum is generated by forces, 
So in other words, a force, an external force, leads to an impulse on an object, gives it linear momentum, and adds to that linear momentum. Then angular momentum is generated by moments. So any type of moment or torque, any type of moment or torque, a twisting action on a particle, basically that moment can be a moment impulse that adds to an object's angular momentum. Okay, so and that's, that's basically my definition. So I'm going to start with a definition here, just to write it out in full. My definition is angular momentum It's nothing more than the moment of linear momentum. So you take linear momentum, you cross it with the r vector from this rotational axis, and you get angular momentum. So if I say linear momentum is an L m v, if I give it that letter capital L as my linear momentum, Okay, then I'm going to write as my angular momentum, I'm going to give it another letter. We're going to say angular momentum is H O, where O is the origin or the axis of rotation. So O is axis of rotation. And so this HO is therefore going to be just that definition. I'm going to take my moment arm, RO, and I'm going to cross it with not the force, but my linear momentum, MB. OK, so that's the definition of angular momentum. And just to, just to be clear on the units, the units, of course, are now, it's going to be mass, so a kilogram times the velocity but with an extra distance. So be extra careful, the units are actually kilogram meters squared second. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a quicker way to calculate the angular momentum, especially for 2D problems. So let's say I have my origin O there, which is the axis of rotation. I draw my R vector RO straight to my particle. And let's say this is my particle P. Okay. So let's just say this particular particle has a linear momentum, and it's just off in the direction where its velocity vector is. So this is my MV, all right? Okay. As it turns out, if dot products are aligning of the two vectors so that you use a cosine theta to get the projection of one vector onto the other, for cross products, you actually take the sine. So the idea is I'm going to take this particular vector. There's going to be a sine component, and there's going to be a cosine component. right? And so this guy, if this is my theta with respect to my r vector, then this vector right here is my mv, oops, mv sine theta. That's the value of my mv sine theta. And that makes a lot of sense. Why? Because looking at this diagram, if you're doing a cross product, everything that points completely perpendicular to your moment arm is doing all of the twisting, right? The component that is along the moment arm doesn't do any twisting at all, so it doesn't contribute to the moment. Therefore, we ignore this vector for a cross product. We only take this one. And so if you were to calculate the magnitude of angular momentum, it would be as if you did R O M V sine theta, like that. You just took the speed right, times the mass, which gives you the linear momentum, the magnitude of it. Then you multiply it by sine theta.
Okay, so that's pretty easy. Okay, and by the way, I, I drew this. I drew this. Uh, I drew this diagram in a way which makes absolute sense in the xy coordinate system, no problem. But if you think about it, I, I also drew it in a way that makes a lot of sense in another coordinate system, which is the polar coordinate system. So if I go from O to this particle, it's almost like I was running along this direction, pointing in the ur direction, right? And this, this particular component of the linear momentum mv is also in ur, and this one is in u theta. So another really beautiful way to write this is in polar coordinates, right? I could easily write my linear momentum, m times velocity. I could easily write it as m v r u r plus an m v theta u theta. Pretty nice. You could just break it into u r u theta components, and actually helps a lot. It basically means that if I only want m v sine theta, it's actually only the component in the u theta direction. So in other words, h o. Another way to write this is the magnitude should be mass times. Uh, I'll just write this with r o mass, and that v sine theta is just v theta. Just like that, in polar coordinates, right? So hopefully you can see the link between all of those. Okay, any, any questions so far? I'm just defining this one extra concept right now. So far, so good. So everything is spinning. We've got an extra, extra moment arm now. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this concept now there should be a principle of angular momentum, and there should be a conservation of angular momentum. So let's step through all of those. Principle of angular momentum and impulse. OK, so where do we start? Just like I wrote here. Angular momentum is nothing more than doing the moment of linear momentum. So if you, if you trust linear momentum makes sense, all I have to do is this. I'm going to put my mv1 here. I'm going to add it to my integral time 1 to time 2, sum of all of my impulse forces, dt. And I'm going to make that equal to my, let me move this a little bit over here. Make that equal to mv2. That's my linear momentum, right? Let's see if I can. And so what does it mean to apply the moment? It's like if I do this, just do an RO, and I apply the RO cross product to every single one of these. OK? All of a sudden, you have principle of angular momentum and impulse. OK? That's it. That's all it is. OK? So now the, the, the nice way that they write it in the textbook is they start using the symbols that I've been introducing to you. So the idea would be h o, right? That's the definition of r o cross m v. This is h o one, okay? The the way you read this is angular momentum capital H around axis of rotation o at time point one, right? So that angular momentum plus what's r cross f? R cross f are our moments. So these are all of the moments. In fact, this represents now the sum of all of the external moments being applied to the system. And I can write this as sum of all moments, like that. OK? And then all that becomes is uh, h o at time point 2. This is now my principal of angular momentum and impulse. Pretty straightforward.
Okay, and then see what else I got here. So, um, now I'll draw your attention to one more thing. You'll actually recall that when I derived this linear momentum uh, and impulse principle, that I actually started with f is equal to m8, right? So I'll, I'll give you a note here. Note that we all started with f is equal to m8, and I made this look like m dv by dt, right? And I made the argument that you can now integrate with respect to time. I'll show you one other thing. Because this m is constant in all of our dynamics problems, because the mass isn't changing, we can actually sneak the mass into the derivative. And so another way of saying Newton's second law is really the time derivative of momentum uh, changes with respect to all the external forces. So this, this is the same thing. If I integrate with time now, I can actually have a starting and ending linear momentum. Okay? So what does that mean when I now add in my, my moments? So adding in moments is the same as if I did this, R O cross F, sum of all Fs, is all moments, right? So sum of all moments around O, and it means that it is the change with respect to time of R cross MB, okay? And you can write this. Sum of all external moments is nothing more than changing the angular momentum of a system over time. Okay, okay so forces means momentum, moments means angular momentum. Okay, and then finally, let's do conservation of angular momentum. And we'll draw the same parallels as before. Conservation of angular momentum Okay. So true if no external moments, right? So whereas before it was no external forces, now you have no external moments. And you can take a sum across all particles i like this. So it'll be h o 1 i sum h o 2 Okay, so lots of subscripts there. It means angular momentum around axis of rotation O at time point one for all particles I. Would be just equal to before and after would be equal, and then the impulse moments all disappear because you don't have any external moments. Okay, any questions on that? All right, let's do an example. Okay, here's, a, here's another thought, by the way. So, so let me, let, let's, do a, let's do a little thought exercise, right? I'm going to put a particle here with a mass, and I'm going to say, here's the velocity vector. Okay, so let's say that I have my axis of rotation over here, O x and y. <clears throat> but let's say I move my coordinate system around. Let's say I want to plant another coordinate system somewhere here, and I want to do it with respect to point A instead of point O. Okay? So the first question is, this particle that has m and a velocity v, by changing my, my perspective from O to A, does my linear momentum change for this particle? m times v. No, it actually, with respect to O or with respect to origin A, same linear momentum, okay? 
does the kinetic energy of this particle change? No. Same m, same speed, mv squared, 1 half mv squared, same kinetic energy. So same linear momentum, same kinetic energy. Now does the angular momentum around these two points, are they the same or they're different? They're different, right? The reason is because for this linear particle, or for this, for this linear momentum around point O, it's actually this part and this moment arm that gives it its angular momentum. So it actually has high angular momentum, whereas with respect to this guy, with respect to A, it's a little closer to the MV. All of a sudden, the, 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 um, the component vector that I'm interested in is this guy, right? And it's a shorter moment arm. Angular momentum is different with respect to this subscript. Okay, so you've got to watch out for this. When you're looking at a system of particles that's spinning about something, you've got to figure out where it's spinning about, and you've got to locate that axis of rotation. Okay, so time for an example. Questions? What's that? Uh, I'm saying from here to here, like, from the particle P to O, this is an RO, right? So that looks like a long distance. This line right here, this R vector is an RA, and I made it a lot closer to my MV, so that's shorter. It does, it's not generated by A. It's the angular momentum is possessed, like the particle possesses angular momentum, just like it possesses linear momentum and it possesses a smaller angular momentum around point A than it does around point O. That's how I would word it, yeah. Uh, is the principle of angular momentum and impulse dependent on Is the principle of angular momentum and impulse dependent on? Coordinate on the coordinate system. Uh, yeah, I would say you're strictly dealing with x, y coordinate system here, okay, all the time. If you change your origin, no, so you, would, you, you only study the problem with respect to one origin at a time, okay? Okay. So let's do an example and then I think hopefully things will clear up a little bit. Okay, so we've got a vertical pendulum. Okay, so I'll do short rod with a mass on the end, and then a longer rod with another mass on the end. Let me draw that again. Okay, so what I have here is a, a, what's called a vertical pendulum. The idea is there's a point of rotation here, origin O, and I've got two masses, they're equal masses, and I'll give you the mass in a second. And they've got, they're different distances away from this center, okay? But right now it's at rest, it's not moving, but what's gonna happen is we're gonna fire a bullet Okay, so there's my little bullet, mass MB. And this bullet is going to impact this bottom mass here, and it's going to get lodged into that mass. Okay, the bullet was fired at an angle with the horizontal with theta B. And what's going to happen after the bullet has been fired is it's going to rotate.
Okay, did I say it was at rest? I meant there was an initial angular velocity. Okay, so it was moving, let's say this, the, the vertical pendulum was actually swinging this way. The bullet is fired, lodges in here, and actually changes the direction of the, of the pendulum. So it's gonna do that. Okay, and it's got a final theta, theta max. Okay, so here's all the data. The mass of the two balls on the ends, mass of the tiny little bullet, R1, R2, and I'll give you the initial velocity of the bullet. BB is 300 meters per second. Theta B, 20 degrees. Bullet embeds into lower mass. Okay, and then Okay, so I'm going to summarize the problem again. Uh, I've given you all the data. There's an initial velocity to the bullet. The pendulum is swinging with an initial angular velocity, six radians per second. And so the angle is changing. And then right at the moment where it aligns up and down, right? So it's swinging down. Right there, bullet comes, impacts bottom mass. And the whole pendulum starts swinging the other way. And we're asked to find the following. There's going to be a final theta max when it swings this way. And we want to know how far up it goes. And we also want to know the final angular velocity at impact. OK? OK, so how do we deal with this? OK, so first things first, you've got a point of rotation. So you can't just handle this with linear momentum. Okay? First thought is it must be angular momentum must be somehow involved. So we're going to use angular momentum. Do we use uh, principle of angular momentum and impulse? Or should we use conservation of angular momentum and impulse? How many people think we should use principle of angular momentum and impulse? OK, why? OK, great. So, so the student says we should use principle of angular momentum and impulse because there is an external force. The external force is created by the bullet, right? The bullet smashes into the mass. There should be a force. Do we know the value of that force? No. Do we know how much time it took for it to embed into the mass? No. There's lots of missing pieces of information, right? So, so it looks to me like it's going to be pretty challenging to do that. So now let's switch our thinking. Let's try to do conservation of angular momentum. How does that work? Well, yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. So initially, this bullet has linear momentum, MBVB, right? This linear momentum is a certain distance away from O, so it itself has angular momentum. We just have to include the bullet as part of the system. 
if we do that, then as soon as the bullet hits this mass, the impact, the force between the two, is actually internal to the system. So they cancel each other out. So the whole key to this question is actually recognizing that the bullet isn't creating an external moment on this mass. It's creating an internal moment if the original mass of the bullet and its momentum are included as part of the system. So that's the, that's the whole thing with this problem. The solution to avoid having to figure out the, um, the force of impact and how much time it took, you're going to use conservation of angular momentum. And make sure to include bullet in the system. That's the trick. Okay? So that means we do the following H O of one, all of the I's is some h o all of the i's for 2. OK? And by the way, I've dropped, I've ignored the vector notation. Right? So I've ignored the vector notation now. Why? Because now the whole problem so far is 2D because all 2D. And therefore, the axis of rotation is pointing in the k direction. So that means this quantity would have been everything in the k direction. This is also everything in the k direction. So I'm just dropping the vector notation altogether. OK, so now let's break this up. I'm going to include the bullet and the two masses and everything else. Let me leave, uh, let me leave that diagram. OK, so sum of all of the HO1s is the following. So I'm going to have to include. Uh, momentum of this guy and this guy. And so I have to figure out their velocities and everything else. So here's what I'll do. I'll do m at the top, this guy. It's initially spinning this way. So it's actually negative. Negative according to my sign convention. Negative m, it's going to be an r1. That's the moment arm with respect to o. And then I need the velocity. What is the velocity of this particle if I know the initial angular velocity? It's just omega o times the r1 again, right? Because it's r theta dot. So that's this. Okay? Then I'm going to add it to the angular momentum of this mass down here, and that'll be negative m r2 squared omega naught. Okay? And then I'm going to add this bullet's linear momentum with that moment arm. And so I'm going to add it to an R2, and it's going to be MBVB. MBVB. Sorry, I used a capital B there. B. And remember, remember what I said about the angles? So I, I, need, to, I need to take the part the component of this particular bullet with respect to this theta that is completely perpendicular in order for me to get the cross product. So in this particular case, the way that I drew my angle, that's critical. I'm actually doing a theta b with respect to this perpendicular line to the rod. So I'm actually doing a cosine theta b. Not sine, cosine because of the way I drew my theta b. OK? So I'm going to plug in all these numbers, 3.26 radians per second, negative sign, R1 is 
like that. And then I'm going to add the bullet I should have everything there. So total at time one is going to be positive 1.80 kilograms meter square second. And then so now for the final angular momentum, H O two, like that. Okay, so now now you've been told that the the whole vertical pendulum is going to swing now in the opposite direction, which is counterclockwise, positive sense. And so now I'm going to embed the bullet into the bottom mass. It'll be m v plus an m. And now it must be traveling at the velocity of the whole, the, whole, uh, the whole mass down here. And so that has to be m times its one moment arm multiplied by omega final times another r2, like that. And then I add that to m r1 squared omega f. That's it. Okay? And so now I can make this as being my final total angular momentum must therefore be equal to my initial 1.80. And now I can rearrange. So my omega f is 1.80. And then this will be your 5 plus 3.2. Four squared. Two point seven seven radians per second. Okay, so that's my that's my final answer for this particular part. Um, let's take a breather there for a second. Any, any questions? Conceptually, is that okay? Any, any difficulty there? What do you think would happen if you use linear momentum and impulse instead? Do you think it would, do you think it would work? No, I was going to ask you this question. Yeah, go ahead. Ask another question. What happens if the bullet cuts through the ball? Yeah, yeah I, I, don't, I don't know actually. I don't know what would happen. So I would imagine that. Um, I would imagine that you can do the same thing. You can assume uh, what, what you do for the final part would be that this is no longer embedded. So we would have a mass here that the bullet had passed through. But then the mass, the bullet itself, would still have its own angular momentum. So I imagine there must be another term here, which would be m bullet times its own final velocity, maybe the final velocity where it would slow down by the fact that it just went through another mass, right? And then, and then, but then, but then in that case, it's kind of weird because um, clearly there was a ton of friction where you lost a lot of, a lot of energy inside of the ball and, and et cetera. So um, I don't know how you would account for that, but okay. So that's, that's, that's that. Now, 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 I know people are going to end up trying, like they see this problem, they're going to first start maybe using linear momentum and impulse. I'll actually give you one really important piece of information. You can do it if you had more information. You can do linear momentum and impulse. I'll tell you what's happening here, though. You see this 
this pin right here that's holding the vertical pendulum in place, right? So this pin that's holding it in place, when the bullet hits, guess what happens to forces at this pin? There's actually going to be a huge reaction force there. The pin is basically holding the pendulum there, not letting it move, right? So there is actually a huge Fy and Fx reaction force right at impact. And these forces are actually impulse forces in the context of linear momentum. How come we didn't have to deal with them in angular momentum? The reason is because they sit right at O, the axis of rotation. So that's great, because the forces that are all at point O, they don't create moments. You can have as many forces as you want. They don't matter, right? So that's, that's why angular momentum was useful. It was helpful to just get rid of things that you don't actually know about, right? OK, final part of the problem, theta max. Theta max. The theta max reminds you of a previous example problem we did. Pendulums, right? It went up, and then it stops. There's a theta max. What do you think you should be using to solve for theta max? Energy. Why energy? Because it's swinging, it's swinging up, and it's against gravity, right? So you can actually use conservation of energy here. And the idea is there are, right now, after the bullet is embedded, everything that's happening is all purely due to its distance, right? How far it was traveling up against gravity. There were no more other time points to consider, no more before and after, right, in terms of time or impacts. And so the answer is conservation of energy. I'm going to redraw this diagram in a simpler fashion. So there's my O. I'm going to draw, these are like my datum lines, essentially. Right, datum lines for each of the particles. So this was my particle M with mass M. And then now it swung over to here, like that. This is my theta max. And you can see the same triangles appearing. Right? This is my, I'll call this my H. Is that my R1? Yeah. So I'll call this my H1. And then I'm going to draw my H2 right here. Right? So the masses, once they swing up, they're going to be at an H1 and an H2 that were different than what it was before. So now we have to compare their total conserved energy before and after. So this would be a T, uh, see what symbols I used here. I did a T1 plus V1 is T2 plus V2, All right? So if you do your datum lines correctly, we can assume that there was no potential energy in the beginning. So that's the starting position. Then theta max is when there's no more kinetic energy. It's not moving anymore. So what's all the kinetic energy in the beginning? One half one of the masses, and then I'm going to do a omega final, so it was swinging with that final angular velocity with an r1. And that's my velocity. I'm going to take that and square it. And then I'm going to add it to my second mass, m omega f r2 all squared. OK? And actually, I forgot the bullet. Right? The bullet is right here, m plus mb omega f r2 all squared. Yep. And then this is equal to 2.49 joules. And then finally, I got to work on my v2. v2 is all my potential energies. So potential energy up here, it fell. So there's a decrease in its potential energy, negative mgh1. And then the other one gained potential energy because it moved up, plus mmb, the bullet is embedded, gh2. Okay. And then now finally, I can relate h1 and h2 to my r's. 
MGR1. And this is actually going to be one of my one of those one minus cosines. Mg one minus cosine theta max. Like that. Okay? G R two one minus cosine. Yep. So I'll give you some numbers here so you can check them at home. All of that leads to a six point four seven five times the one minus cosine theta max. And I'm going to make this equal to my 2.49 joules. And so theta max theta max is 52 degrees. All right. Question. Can the angular momentum be considered as how fast an object rotates? Okay, so 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 the angular velocity is how fast an object rotates, right? Because that's your theta dot. So angular momentum takes that into account along with its mass. So I'll give you an example, right? The way that you word linear momentum versus linear velocity is you say a truck is traveling down the highway at 90 kilometers an hour. That momentum is super high because it's 90 kilometers per hour times the whole mass of the truck. But another object like, I don't know, a small peanut traveling at 90 kilometers per hour doesn't have the same momentum but has the same speed, right? So the same thing here. The angular momentum is the mass times its linear momentum. So if an object has higher linear momentum, it's going to have higher angular momentum as well if it's the same moment arm. OK? OK. Anything else? One more question, and then I'll let you go. Why do I use, sorry, why do I use omega f? Oh, oh. sorry, sorry. This right here? OK. Shh. OK, so the question is, why did I use omega f over there on that board for kinetic energy? Omega f was what I solved for here after the bullet was embedded. After the bullet was embedded, the momentum calculation is done, but that's the start of the kinetic energy calculation. So the velocity of the two balls are now moving with that velocity, which is omega f times the moment arm. Okay. All right, guys, thanks very much. Uh, enjoy your reading week, and I'll see you in a week.